Now, focusing more on Siberia, why they would live up there, first of all, it wouldn't be that cold during this kind of ice age. A guy did an experiment. Uh, he just took the, the sea ice off the Arctic Ocean for the wintertime, but left the temperature at the freezing point of seawater, which is about minus two degrees centigrade, and winters warmed this much, 40 degrees near the North Pole. See northern Siberia, it warmed 20 degrees centigrade just by getting rid of the sea ice. But what if the temperature was 70, 80 degrees at the end of the flood? It'd be a lot warmer in Siberia, right up in here in Alaska where the woolly mammoth live. So all this warmth plus other mechanisms for warmth during this ice age, this unique ice age, would end up with a lot warmer climate in Siberia. In fact, you have a lot of onshore flow of warm air from the Arctic Ocean and also the North Pacific Ocean. And also the storm belt would, would be in here, so it would be stormy and wet for quite a while. And a lot warmer in Asia, in, in Siberia. So these are based on the post-flood ice age. I think these are significant factors why the woolly mammoth would even want to live in Siberia. It wasn't bitterly cold like, like it is today. There was no permafrost. Then the question is, if it's a 700-year ice age, do we have enough time for millions of mammoths? If there was 5 million between the Yana and the Coma River, you could probably say there's 10, 15 million mammoths probably buried in the permafrost. Do we have time in a 700-year ice age for 15 million mammoths? How are we going to find out? Well, I did a lot of study of the gestation period of elephants and their doubling time and this sort of thing. The best thing is to, to go to the South Africa and figure out the doubling times in various environments. Now here's one doubling time in one environment in 25 years. You, in 25 years, you can have 8 million mammoths in 550 million years at a doubling time of every 25 years from two individuals that left the ark, or maybe they're the elephant kind and the mammoth genes got uh, through natural selection, uh, became, uh, got uh, split off uh, to form the mammoth. Whatever, it doesn't really matter, but because the doubling time in 25 years, you'd have approximately uh, 8,550,000 years. I'm not going to talk about that. It's an intermediate figure. But in one, I found, in 10 years, they doubled. Now, there's a lot of different preserves in Africa, and there, some are protected. There's a lot of poaching and lots of stuff like this. So there's a lot of variability. That's why I got the different doubling time. So if, if I use this, this 10 years, which would uh, probably approximate the, the er, early post-flood period when the environment was rich, there are no predators, they would multiply rapidly, you can have 1.3 billion in 300 years. So it's not really not a problem getting millions of mammoths after the flood in a rapid uh, post-flood ice age. Now here's kind of a timeline of the mammoths. Whether it's an elephant kind that leaves the ark or a mammoth kind doesn't matter, but regardless, the mammoths, uh, they, they start off slowly. Time goes to the right and the number goes up to the left. And they increase slowly, but then they really mushroom. And towards the peak of the ice age, they become colder and drier and windy, as I will talk about. And suddenly, they go extinct to zero at the end of the ice age. That's the uh, mammoth timeline since the time of the flood. Now, as the ice age builds, sea level lowers because it's the water from the ocean that ends up as ice. So as sea level lowers, you end up shallowing out that very shallow Bering Land Bridge and uh, the shelf off northern Siberia, right in here. And that would allow woolly mammoths to spread not only to Siberia, and by the way, I don't think they spread up there right away. I think it was pretty wet and warm, and probably trees grew right after the flood. But it cooled off, dried, and I think it would be a lot better environment, say, about uh, 200 years after the flood. But regardless, they could spread from Siberia across the Bering Land Bridge, down through what's called an ice-free corridor, down through where I live, right in there, before the ice covered it up in there. That's, I believe, the migration of the woolly mammoths. Man, I think, took this route right in here. I don't think any animals uh, went down there, but, but uh, both man and animals probably took both routes. But mammoths spread through North America that way. What about the temperatures of Siberia? To give you a better picture of how I think these are postulated. I emphasize postulated because there's no way to know that. I think right at the end of the flood, you had very little seasonal contrast, and it was fairly mild in Siberia. But as time went on, it gradually cooled, and, the, and you had more of a seasonal contrast, to the point where at the end of the Ice Age, it got very cold, colder than today, and winters were quite cold. 
And Summers were were cold too, but they they all uh, rebounded afterwards. So that's the timeline for temperature. For precipitation, because you had a lot more evaporation early in the flood, I think the evaporation was high, precip was high, but, but as the time went on, it, the oceans cooled, the ice formed, you had a lot more reasons for a drier climate, and this is where I think the animals spread up into Siberia, right in here, and because it continued to dry, and they got caught in cold, drought, and uh, other factors I'll get into. And permafrost, I think you had no permafrost at the end of the flood, by definition, because of the warm water and because of the newly deposited sediments. And the permafrost would start building slowly, slowly, and by the time you get to the end of the Ice Age, probably a lot of permafrost. And I think because of warming after the end of the Ice Age, caused by the melting of the ice sheets, like the Siberian, excuse me, the Scandinavian ice sheet and the ice sheets in North America, you had a warming trend. You had a warming trend since the end of the Ice Age up there. That's just to give you an idea of the temperatures and precipitation surrounding the life and death of the, the mammoths in Siberia. So, three mysteries. Why live in Siberia? First of all, it was probably a lot warmer. I can't, I don't think we can do anything about the darkness. But a lot of animals live in the dark. In fact, uh, in Montana, most of the, the big game animals, they come out and feed at night. So the dark doesn't really bother them at all. But it wasn't bitterly cold up there. And it wasn't a bog land in the summer. You probably had some bog here and there, but it wasn't too boggy. It was mostly a grassland, so that's why they can live in Siberia. What would they eat? Well, a grassland is very rich, and they fed on grass and low bushes, and so there was plenty to eat in the vast expanse. It's a huge area uh, in Siberia and the lowlands of, of Alaska and, and uh, Yukon. No bog vegetation. Then the third question, how did they die? This is the most mysterious of all. Here's what I... I think you have to do to find out how they die. I examine what is the sediment that they're found in. Are they found in bog sediments? Are they found in river sediments, round gravel, or what? Well, the best way to find out is to go to the experts that study them. And you know, it's kind of interesting what they say. A particular interest for the paleozoologists is the odama. Now, these, they're found in these odamas. They're like hills. And the only hills because the permafrost is melted around it and left some permafrost unmelted in hills. That's all there is. But the significant thing about these areas is that, that, that the material is actually a lust layer as a rule containing the largest amount of remains of late Pleistocene animals. Lust is windblown silt. Mostly silt, little clay, little sand. They're found in dust storm deposits. So... That uh, presents a good possibility. They can, uh, dust storms can account for a lot of these. And Guthrie, Dale Guthrie, says in his book Frozen Fauna of the Mammoth Steppe, like most of the Soviet Far East, large expanses of Alaska and the Yukon Territory were not glaciated during the Pleistocene. Because these areas were bounded on several sides by enormous glaciers, that's in the mountains, there you had mountain glaciers, and glacial outwash streams, Today, much of Beringia, that is eastern Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon, is mantled with a thick deposit of aeolian, that is windblown silt, called lus. So the experts say they're, they're found in windblown silt. So the idea, they believe they were buried in dust storms. Now, I believe that, that most of them died normal deaths, and the dust just covered them up. And the permafrost came up, and to meet them. They didn't have to be jammed in the permafrost. In fact, I went to the Dust Bowl, and some of these uh, dust storms during the Dust Bowl era were huge. Some of them were like blizzards that had drifts six feet tall, covering machinery up to uh, the gables on a uh, two-story building. So I would say that's probably a good analog, not only to cover a lot of the, the mammoths that died normally, but I think it can account for the mammoth uh, carcasses. First of all, why did we have dust storms? Why would we have dust storms late in the Ice Age? Well, first of all, colder winters. Colder oceans means less evaporation, drier air. And you had more sea ice to cause more cold. And a drier atmosphere, of course. And you had a stronger north-south temperature difference. That drives the upper winds. The stronger the north-south temperature difference, the stronger the upper winds. And so you had a lot stronger winds, dry storms. So it's just a natural... Uh, meteorological phenomenon at the end of the Ice Age. K-1 
Can this ice age uh, explain the carcass puzzles? Well, I believe I've already uh, gave you an, a reasonable explanation for the half decay vegetation. How about the standing upright? Is it possible that you had a woolly mammoth standing out and he got caught in a dust storm and he tried to ride it out and the dust packed up around him like in a blizzard, uh, packs up around a, a snow fence and it packed in and kept him in a standing position. He died in a standing position. You think that's possible? I think it's, it's likely that that could account for them being in a standing position. Also, these dust storms can suffocate them. They can breathe in so much dust from these strong winds that they can suffocate. Or it's possible that even one of these gigantic dust storms could totally cover a mammoth. And the broken bones, I'll get into that later. It's possible to explain that that way. And you can entomb them rapidly in permafrost because the permafrost comes up into the newly deposited dust. So they automatically get put into the permafrost from the up, the, the, uh, moving up. The broken bones. Now there's two types of the broken bones. There's the, the arm bones. I think the arm bones on the bear sabaka mammoth are the one. Now that was uh, broken while he was alive because of the blood all, uh, in the tissues. I think uh, the way that probably can be explained is they're trying to move around in this packed dust. When this dust packs, it's kind of like, almost like cement around you. You can hardly move. It snows the same way, I might add. And so he could have broken his bones by the torsion. You know, there's a place in South Dakota called Hot Springs, South Dakota, where a number of the, the mammoths they found in a sinkhole, 52 mammoths, some of them have broken arm bones. And Larry Agenbrod, an expert on woolly mammoths or mammoths in general, says, the processes that would provide such breakage are limited to only two. And I think we can exclude number two. But number one, torsional stress as provided by trying to extricate a limb mired in mud, muck, quicksand, etc. So I think because of, the, of what you had at Hot Springs, South Dakota in the USA, I think that could explain the broken bones in the Bears of Aka mammoth uh, trying to extricate itself from windblown silt packing up around it. The other bones, like the broken pelvis and broken ribs, I think can be explained by shifting permafrost. Permafrost is known to shift 10 to 15 meters. And when that shifts, you know, if there's an animal in there, it breaks, it'll break its bones. So let's tie it all together here. These are a series of uh, cartoon series uh, that Dan Letha drew for me. Here's a woolly mammoth pleasantly eating grass and, of course, buttercups. We find buttercups in their stomach and in their, their mouth. And suddenly, uh-oh, the wind's picking up, and I'll turn my back, and the dust starts packing around them. By the way, this is only for the carcasses, not the normal death and burial. These are the extreme cases. These are gigantic windstorms. And it continues to pack around them. He breathes it in. He suffocates in a general standing position. And he either gets covered or eventually gets covered. And uh, then the permafrost comes up, to meet him, and then it shifts to break his pelvis. This is a quickie to kind of give you an idea how gigantic dust storms are a reasonable explanation to account for uh, the mammoths up there. Why can't mainstream geologists see the importance of windblown silt as, a, as an explanation for the mammoth mysteries, which has been around for over 200 years? It's because of their time scale. For instance, Barish again says, one important factor was the fall of lust on the cold, wet ground. However, this deposition can hardly have exceeded two to three centimeters. He is generous for a uniformitarian. Two to three centimeters of dust accumulation a year. But he says even at that rate, it would take 20 to 30 years to cover a mammoth, during which time the bones and tusks would have been almost entirely destroyed. So even at his rate, you couldn't preserve them. Uh, Dale Guthrie is even less pessimistic. He says... These large bones could not be preserved by a few millimeters of annual aeolian lust fall. Their preservation requires large quantities of reworked silt. They can't see it because they stretch out the time for the, the, the silt deposited in Siberia. They cannot see because of their stretched out time scale. Time is not a side issue. I'm finding that time is a help to solve a number of these mysteries of, of the recent past. By the way, the New Siberian Islands are probably chock full of bones because I believe rapid sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age, they would find themselves in the continental shelves with the water coming up pretty fast, and they'd go to higher land, which is the New Siberian Islands, 
and the sea came around them, and they ended up being on an island with hardly any food. And that's why I believe you have so many there. Why did so many mammals, large mammals and birds, go extinct worldwide at the Ice Age? I think it's due to dust storms, cold, drought, and probably fires. So the post flood rapid ice age accounts for the lowlands of Siberia not glaciated, why mammoths lived in Siberia in the first place. I believe it can account for the mix of warm and cold climate animals you find in Siberia and all across the northern hemisphere, I might add. The abundance of food in the grass in Siberia, how mammoths and other animals went extinct, a reasonable explanation for the many mammoth mysteries are provided by the post-flood rapid ice age. This ice age is a climate consequence of Noah's flood. This supports the Bible and is against the present processes over millions of years alternative hypothesis. Thank you.